Oh, that's your. Sorry. <laughs> that's gonna grab your notes. Well, welcome to Muscatine Community College and to our exciting lecture on Lou Henry Hoover. And I have the privilege of introducing our speaker today, Matt Schaefer, who has been an outreach archivist at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library for 18 years. Um, I believe he knows several of you already, and so I'm excited to welcome him. This is his first time at Muscatine Community College. And his primary duties at the Presidential Library include organizing conferences, working with professional organizations, and keeping the Hoover Library in the public eye. Schaefer always works, uh, also works on references and collection management tasks. So in celebration of uh, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, we're very excited to have this presentation here. I also want to recognize our co-partners -par the League of Women Voters of Muscatine County. Thank you very much. Seems like everything cool that we do, we're sponsoring with you or with the Alexander Clark Foundation. Someone is always involved with us. We are live streaming this presentation to our other campuses as well. And so I'm excited to introduce you to Matt Schaefer. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Sound level good? Sound level good? OK, excellent. Leaving voters, always happy to see you. You're going to love my talk. Foreshadowing. Um, I, like uh, Naomi said, Matt Schaefer, Hoover Library, uh, many hats. One of the hats I wear is a fitness and wellness director, liaison. So if I spend a lot of time afterwards with my hands in my pockets, it's not because I'm shy or channeling Herbert Hoover. It's because there's, you've probably heard, this virus thing out there. So be safe, be smart. Um, Lou Henry Hoover, Iowa's only first lady. What's that? Is that Mamie spinning? No, she left too early. We don't count her. Okay, you know, show me the Mamie Dowd Eisenhower statue. That's what I say, show me the statue. There are statues of Lou in Waterloo. She was born in Waterloo. Um, her father was a banker. Her mother, you know, a, a, a stay-at-home mom. And uh, she lived in Waterloo for the first eight years of her life. Uh, then her mother got sick, and began, there began a very uh, long and disjointed journey as the family looked for places to find respite from Mrs. Hoover's Florence, Hen Florence Henry's respiratory ailments. They ultimately lit in California, where Lou found herself as a young woman. Oh, I should probably do the slideshow. I once got through a whole slideshow when somebody's first question was, did you intend to leave that slide up there all the time? <laughs> no, sir, I did not. OK, a girl from Waterloo. All that stuff I just said, for those of you who are, are visual learners. Uh, this is Lou, uh, the, tall, the, the taller older daughter, the dog we don't know the name of, and her little sister, Jean. Uh, Mr. Henry wanted daughters. Charles, daughters, I'm sorry, wanted sons, named his girls with, uh, uh, what is it, gender neutral names, and raised them to follow their bliss, do whatever they felt like doing. So Mrs. Hoover grew up, uh, well, when I was growing up, she would have been called a tomboy. I don't know if that's a phrase or a word that's even in existence anymore. Anyone know what a tomboy is? Of course I do. I'm looking, I'm looking at adults. I don't have to ask. When I have fifth graders, it's like, a oh, what? <laughs> Never mind. Um, they end up in California in 1887, where Lou is a high school student, writes one of her very early essays. Her parents loved her because they kept all of her juvenile writings. Uh, you know, we, we have very little to document Herbert Hoover's early life and times, except the, the cottage he, he was born in. We have boxes of Mrs. Hoover, of, of, of Lou Henry's juvenile writings, including an essay she wrote as a 15-year-old on Women's suffrage. Okay, 1889, women's suffrage is a state issue. Uh, it has been cooking along since. Okay, League of Women Voters. You didn't think you were going to be quizzed. 
1848, Seneca Falls. Although that date's getting squishy now. Um, anyhow, she says, ah, I've given very little thought to the matter because uh, it has not affected my own individual happiness. Yay, she's 15. She's not worried about the vote at 15. But, but, and this is a big but, to be classified with the idiot, the maniac, and the jailbird, to be seen as far below the roughest, least intelligent scamp of a man, well, that, that cannot be overlooked. Women should have the vote. So even though she says she's given very little thought, she's actually thought it through about as well as Elizabeth Cady Stanton. You know, it's like, basically, she's channeling all the arguments used by suffrage organi organizers in the 1880s at this time. Uh, what I like is that her future mother-in-law, long way away and you know, has no idea that their paths are ever going to intersect, had, writes a letter at about the same time to her sister Agnes, coming away from a, a Women's Christian Temperance Union, WCTU meeting, uh, saying, and after the WCTU meeting, uh, a suffrage meeting broke out. Okay, they, had, they were walking on parallel paths in the 1880s. And she said, you know, at the end, a woman need only be left a widow and have to manage anything to do with business, and she will be strong for the rest of her life. Uh, Mrs. Hoover is writing this after her husband has died and shortly before she's about to pass away, and she's trying to untangle his estate and trying to manage the blacksmith shop that he had run. Uh, women in the 1880s had uh, very few, um, a very few property rights, very, 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 and, and were extremely limited in what they could do in terms of ownership. Um, so that's kind of the baseline for Mrs. Hoover uh, and, and young Miss Henry. There's an independent girl. Uh, another essay that she wrote a little bit, a little bit later, The Independent Girl. Uh, a person before whose wrath only the most rash dare, dare stand, and they, it must be confessed, with much fear and trembling. Another essay she wrote in high school. There is a bold and independent-minded young, young woman who's come, you know, knows her own mind, and by God is not afraid to speak it. That's one of our earliest pictures of her. She is uh, getting, ready, getting ready to go camping, uh, to head for the hills, literally. Uh, she ends up at Stanford University where she runs into our guy. Our guy, uh, whenever I use that phrase, is? Herbert Hoover. All right, I haven't lost you yet. Herbert Hoover. And at Stanford, uh, she runs into the back half of her independent girl essay. But sooner or later, she's bound to meet a spirit equally as independent as her own. And then there's a clash of arms ending in mortal combat. OK, it wasn't the mortal combat you young folks think about. It was mortal combat like tied, you know, bring it. And if they unite their forces, they, with combined strength, go forth and meet the world. And that's what they did. They went forth, met the world, and conquered it, at least in their own way. Um, at Stanford, uh, she meets Herbert Hoover, the guy she's ultimately going to marry. Uh, he is a couple of years ahead of her in terms of academic uh, um, development. He graduates in 1895. She's going to graduate in 1898. In the three years in the interim, he goes off and makes his fortune as a, as a mining engineer in Australia. And he had left it, understood with her that once he made his, you know, once he had his feet under him, uh, they were going to get married. Uh, he sent her a telegram saying, I've got, uh, I'm secure now. The people, are, the, the, they're not going to fire me. Uh, can we set a date? And they do. Uh, February 10th, 1899. This is Florence Henry, uh, Lou's mother, saying, I didn't know about that guy. He, you know, never came by for a visit. Lou seemed smitten, but uh, then she met him and said, eh, he'll do. He'll do. Okay. February 10th, 1899, they're married. Uh, th this is a bridal uh, group dressed in traveling clothes because the very next day they're getting on a slow boat to China. <laughs> I love having an audience that gets all of my vague and dated <laughs> cultural references. You wouldn't believe how many fifth graders give me that. <laughs> and I realize, God, I'm old. <laughs> uh, okay, in China, uh, he's doing the mining engineer thing. She's doing the uh, mining engineer wife uh, travel and tourism thing. She's learning the language. She's in, uh, reading up on the culture. She actually writes an article on the Empress Dowager, the last empress of China. Uh, it never gets published, but she has a mind that's engaged. You know, you know, the world interests her, and she's engaged in it. 
While she's in China, the Boxer Rebellion breaks out. I'm sorry, I went too fast. The Boxer Rebellion rebels against all things Western, uh, anything that had to do with exploitative uh, enterprise, as a, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Mining Engineer taking uh, coal and taking profits out of China. The Hoovers were under fire in Tianjin. Uh, the siege is broken. They obviously survived it. Mrs. Hoover writes to her college roommate uh, after the siege is broken, Dear Evelyn, you've missed the time of your life. There's no place I would rather be than in Tianjin, summer 1900. <laughs> okay, for uh, contemporary references, it's, uh, and again, I'm revealing my age, it's like writing from Beirut in the, the 1980s. It's like writing from Baghdad in 2004. I can't think of anywhere I'd want to be. I can think of a lot of places, not under fire. Okay, uh, they decide ultimately to decamp to London because life on the road is a little, uh, ten not tenuous, it's, 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 it's sometimes traumatic, it's sometimes uh, difficult, and they want to start a family. So they spend the next 15 years in London uh, where they have their two sons, 1903 and 1907, Herbert Jr. and Alan, and w meanwhile, the streams of women's suffragism, suffra the suffragette movement and the suffragist movement in England are getting underway. Mrs. Hoover doesn't have time for that. She's a mother, she's got her own interest, she has friends who are actively involved in the suffrage movement, and she keeps them, you know, arm's length, just because she, she's got other stuff to do. Uh, well, among the things she did was she translated De Re Metallica, and I'm looking at a lot of people in the audience, and you probably are familiar with the story, bear with me. I, I, I'll try to offer a shading that you don't know. De Re Metallica was a mining encyclopedia, written in 1556 by a German scholar, uh, written in Latin. He did not know Latin, so he's kind of stretching. And it was regarded as untranslatable. It had been, you know, people had tried and failed for 300 years to translate this. The Hoovers did it between 1908 and 1912. They just said, we can crack this, get us some books, we have time. Crossword puzzles haven't been invented. <laughs> True fact, you can look it up. Uh, and they translate De Re Metallica, they, they, they have it published, it looks like this really marvelous uh, 16th century book. Uh, it's in vellum, the paper is, is, is period. Um, they win for their achievements, the Lifetime uh, Mining and Metallurgy Award, both of them. She's the first woman to win it and the last for over 90 years. And they each get this gold medal and they're, they're on display at the museum. What we don't have on display at the museum is Hoover's, Mr. Hoover's um, acceptance speech. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored by this, thank you very much. And we, well, we, we have a copy of that, it's, it's not on display. We have a copy of Mrs. Hoover's accept, acceptance speech. That ha that's one of my favorite documents because it's a little five page typed document entitled, An Impromptu Speech to be Made if Called Upon. <laughs> I do not know what impromptu meant in 1914. It might mean something different now. Uh, anyhow, she goes on and thanks, you know, thanks the Academy, you know, thanks the International. It's, it, she said, and it's really great for me to have this now because I'm the mother of two young sons. Now, she has one. And I can just imagine her. She's, she's in this room, you know, vast. There, there, I, I, I've seen pictures. There are four or five hundred men in this room. The women are servers. She's the, one of the few women in this room, the only woman at the head table. And, you know, there's an independent intrepid woman, I really like your award. Now I can have dinner with my kids and not lose the argument. Um, okay, sidebar, that was, that was a, but I love that story. Um, while she's doing that, one of her college classmates, Ann Martin, is working hard as a suffragist. Uh, that is to say, she's gone to England to work in the suffrage movement uh, to to, get, to, gang, to gain votes for women. She was getting no traction in Nevada, so she said, by gum and by golly, I'm going to England. Oh, there's Herbert and Allen, women's suffrage, divergent streams. Ann Martin. Who is Ann Martin? A college classmate of Lou Hoover who goes to London with a specific purpose. She, she is bunking with the Hoovers. She, you know, they have a big house. Sure, stay with us, it'll be fine. Her specific intention is to get arrested and to die a martyr's death in a British jail, dying on the cause of, for the cause of suffrage. And Mr. Hoover's baffled. It's like, 
Uh, your friend? Lou Sen. Was. Uh, Mr. Hoover goes down and bails her out the first time. He says, I got to work here. Come on, please, chill. Uh, and she says, no, by gum, I'm committed to the cause. And he says to, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he says to his wife, can you corral this woman? And Lou probably says, she's an independent woman like me. She, I can no more corral her than you can corral me. She gets arrested again. Again, with the intention of being a martyr to suffrage. And Hoover goes down and bails her out again. And I have a feeling, because she then gets on a boat and goes back to Nevada to, to fight for martyrdom in Nevada and fight for suffrage in Nevada, which she then goes on to be for the next six years. I can just, uh, Hoover writes about them as this episode in his memoirs. He doesn't identify her by name. It, it's an unnamed friend of the family. Uh, and when I found the Ann Martin letters, I just thought, there's no mistaking who this is. It, Ann Martin is the unnamed woman. Um, what Mrs. Hoover is doing, uh, World War I intervenes, and she finds herself working with her husband uh, to offer relief in London, first to the American citizens stranded on the wrong side of the, uh, of the Atlantic during the war. And then uh, she does that for about uh, eight weeks, nine weeks, from August of 1914 to October of 1914. They get tens of thousands of citizens home. She is uh, very active and engaged. It's a, it's, a, it's a kaleidoscope of women's activism. Uh, the, I think they had more names than weeks for the organizations they worked for. Um, but they finally get the situation under control. Uh, most of the American citizens who have to get back home are home already or on route. Herbert Hoover says to his wife, you take the boys and go home. I will be out shortly. I have to close out my business operations here. Uh, I'll join you as soon as I can. That's mid-October 1914. Lou gets on the Lusitania, sails, obviously gets home. The Lusitania is not sunk for a couple of months yet. Uh, and Bert stays in England to wrap up his business. Going to get it you know, tidy, tied up, so he can come and live with the family in Palo Alto. Well, while he's trying to tidy things up, the Belgian government realizes 9 million people in Belgium and northern France are on the brink of starvation if we don't get food into them soon. Hoover is tapped to lead that food relief effort. Herbert Hoover is tapped to lead that food relief effort, and that's what he's going to do for the next 30 months. Meanwhile, Lou is stateside, and she's doing what she can to raise money for this. So her mission from World War I, she begins to take a step out of the private sphere. She's, she's no longer my wife, mother, scholar. She now has an active role in, the, you know, in fundraising for the Commission for Relief of Belgium. Um, and she's good at it. She's really good at it. She raises a lot of money in California, uh, raises a lot of interest uh, for Belgian lace. And you know, we're, we're getting, to getting to the point in her life cycle where, OK, the kids are now uh, you know, four, uh, 11 or 15 years old at the end of the war. You can leave them. They're not going to set each other on fire. And you can begin to pursue your bliss otherwise. You, you, you can begin to pursue your interest. Uh, meanwhile, Ann Martin. I want to be sure where I'm at here. Oh, too far. Sorry. I don't know how many slides I have. I have a lot of things to say. Uh, Ann Martin has gone back to Nevada to fight for the vote. And, and, and she wins. Uh, Nevada was like Iowa. You had to pass in two successive uh, general assemblies uh, the right to you know anything if you wanted it passed. So in two successive general assemblies, they get women's suffrage passed in, in Nevada. And Ann Martin is you know writing to Lou saying, we've done it. We've done it with our victory. And Lou's like, that's nice, dear. <laughs> it's not really my fight, but yeah, go ahead. Um, Anne Martin then runs for Senate in Nevada in 1917 and writes, you know, sends Lou basically her campaign literature, a four-page letter talking about what she wants to fight for. I want to fight for peace. I want to fight for social justice. I want to fight for the working men and women of, uh, of America. I'm looking at <laughs> Jeff. Does this sound like anybody's campaign speech or everybody's campaign speech? <laughs> You know, uh, what's not in her agenda, what's not anywhere in the mix, is women's suffrage. You know, she has, Ann Martin has left that behind and is fighting for the, the important issues of the day. You know, uh, I want to, you know, if, if we have peace, we must have it on Wilson's 14 points, that kind of thing. And um, ask Lou Hoover for support. And Lou writes back, you know, Ann, it's, it's not my struggle. It's, it's, I, I'm busy here. Uh, working with the U.S. Food Administration, still working to raise money for the Commission of Relief of Belgium. I, 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 I don't have time to help you. Uh, please, you know, ask me for something I can help you with that I can come in, uh, you know, and be committed to. 
and and gets a little a little nose out of joint. <laughs> and uh, the next contact we have is actually not from Ann Martin to Lou Hoover, but it's from one of Ann Martin's friends, Mrs. Kent, saying, "Ann was really hurt, and and she's really uh, like upside down in debt because campaigns are expensive. Could you?" Uh, Maybe give us a couple hundred, 500 perhaps, to, to carry on the work. And Lou says, I love Anne. Anne is a dear friend. Uh, I can't do this because if she knows it comes from me, it's going to really mess up our relationship. We'll work something out. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's an interesting little dynamic there, I think. Um, I will leave Anne Martin. But I, just, I, I work in the archives when I find something interesting. Uh, it's really interesting to me. Uh, a year from now, it probably won't be, and you won't have to hear the Ann Martin story. Uh, at the end of the war, Mr. Hoover joins Wilson, goes off to Paris to hammer out the, the, uh, the Paris Peace Accord, the, you know, the treat, what ends up being the Treaty of Versailles. Mrs. Hoover goes back to California, where she works building her dream home. The boys are old enough to get fully situated, get squared away, and uh, works with the architect to build uh, what ultimately ends up being a 20,000 square foot house. 20,000 square feet. I'm willing to bet this building probably has 20,000 square feet under roof. I'm looking at you, Naomi. <laughs> I, 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 I like to put people on the spot. Uh, um, and, you know, she, she's working closely with the design elements, the architect, and it's no sooner completed then Herbert Hoover is tapped to be the Secretary of Commerce. Tells his wife. She is, as you might expect, less than thrilled. <laughs> you go out first. I'll join you. And they become a bi-coastal family. Uh, I mean, she, they spend as much time as possible together in DC, but she's got her dream house. She's going to live in her dream house as much as possible. She's got the boys in school here. We're going we're to go on from there. Uh, what Mrs. Hoover does after World War I is she really spreads her wings and begins to take flight as an activist. Her activity is focused primarily on the Girl Scouts. A lot of people want her time. She's very smart, she's very capable, she's very competent. She's also very careful of her time. And she weighed her options and said, Girl Scouts. That's the one thing that resonates with me. Uh, when the Girl Scouts ask, my answer is going to be yes. Anybody else ask, I'm going to check my Girl Scout calendar. And that's how she runs her life through the 20s. Uh, her second favorite enterprise, women's athletics. Uh, there was a National Amateur Athletic Federation uh, trying to bring together you know, uh, athleticism for high school and college age students. And you know, boys and girls did not play together. They don't play together now. Uh, and Mrs. Hoover said, I will give you guys some time because God knows you need it. The, the men running the program were less capable than she was. She comes in, does a lot of fundraising, taps into her Girl Scout network, taps into friends, and gets the women's division of the National Amateur Athletic Federation squared away. Uh, the director of the men's side writes, can you do that for us? <laughs> and, and she said, it's really not my thing. You guys figure it out. Uh, so that takes up a lot of her time. If you look at her speeches, it's Girl Scouts and NAAF. And every now and again, distant down the chain, League of Women Voters. Because she, as distant and cool and arm's length as she was with suffrage and the suffrage movement, she embraced the League of Women Voters. Because it hit her in a sweet spot. It was about citizenship. It was about political engagement. It was about an informed vote. You know, that we have the vote means nothing. It's how we use it. And every talk she gives from 1920 May through uh, the last one I see is in 1926, she is echoing the women's, the League of Women Voters um, uh, platform. Almost, not, not quite word for word, but it's, you know, it's about, uh, she goes to Bryn Mawr College in April 1920. I can go back to my text. I should probably do that every now and again. Uh, and she's asked to uh, speak on the, uh, the establishment of the Anna Howard Shaw Chair of Political Science. Anna Howard Shaw was a big activist in the suffrage movement and also in the League of Women Voters. And she said, I'm really honored to be here. That we have the vote means nothing. That we use it 
the right way means everything. Our work should be carried out exactly as our college work. As it, you know, it should be variations on that talk in, well, to the League of Women Voters in October uh, 1923, where she tweaks it a little bit and says, it's possible to be both a career woman and a mother. I'm doing a movement who have been active um, you know, from, the, from the outset. And uh, you know, our goals are to train citizens to focus on the issues of the day, child labor, international peace, the American, the American role in the world, uh, you know, economic issues. Uh, okay, it's one thing to get up and talk and, you know, put your money where your mouth is, sister, and she did. Uh, she was asked several times in the early years of the League. The League of Women Voters starts in 1920, I think, like December of 1920. Help me out here. If, if I'm putting in the wrong year. Uh, in April of 1921, they have a solicitation letter. Okay, and I want to back up just a little bit here. In 1913, the National American Women's Suffrage Association uh, sent Lou a solicitation letter. Uh, you know, we need $15,000 to get through uh, our, our work this year. Without it, we're going to have to close our office. Mrs. Hoover doesn't respond. Her friend Dan Martin sends one. Uh, when the League of Women Voters in 1920 says, can you contribute? Uh, can we count on you for $1,000? In a heartbeat. Well, not exactly a heartbeat. Uh, she said, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll put me down for $1,000. Get back and touch me and I'll, I'll, I'll cut you a check. That was April. In July, they write in a, a letter, uh, about that $1,000, we, we haven't received the check yet. Oh, my bad. And cuts from the check the next day. And she gives them $1,000 a year, 1921, 1922, 1923, 1924. So she is putting her money where her mouth is. And the, the, the people in the National League of Women Voters are really delighted because $1,000 is more than uh, 1,000, uh, the, their annual budget was between 80 and $120,000 a year. 80,000 in the early years, 120. So she's basically covering 1% of the national operation. And she says, I'm gonna do this, but here's my condition. I don't want my name associated. Credit the California League. So if we didn't have the, you know, her checks, we would never know. We wouldn't be able to go to the National League of Women Voters and, tr and backtrack it to Lou. That's just, that, that's kind of how Lou operated. Um, and her support was appreciated. The, the National League, uh, I mean, if you look at the correspondence, uh, it's like a who's who in the National League of Women Voters. There's Anna Howard Shaw, there's Carrie Chapman Catt, Maud Park, uh, Claire Morrison, th these names, you know, uh, M. Carrie Thomas. These names mean something to do for people who do women's history. My wife. She runs the Iowa Women's Archives. So she said, be sure to give them all, all a shout out. And, uh, and, and these women are writing to Lou, deeply appreciating her work for, for the cause. Um, Claire Morrison, who was uh, uh, secretary and then treasurer for, for most of the 1920s, says, thank you for your continued support. We had a very constructive meeting this spring and uh, much appreciated uh, after the hideous controversy and disillusion of the last year. Evidently, there was some fussing and feuding within the League of Women Voters. I'm sure that doesn't happen anymore, but y'all are all pulling on the oars in the same direction, because that's how organizations work. You don't put eight strong-minded women in a room and have eight people going in one direction. You don't put eight strong-minded people in a room and have them all going in one direction. Um, anyhow, she, she is offering, uh, th these people are offering basically testimonials to Luke, saying thank you for your support, you know, um, uh, and lose you know, you guys are good. You guys have a fine group of women. You're working on the, the important things. You're bringing important issues to light. I, I like the idea of doing forums to educate citizens. I think that's a, 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 a suitable path forward. Uh, so feeling confident, the League of Women Voters says, hey, can we get your husband to talk? Uh, okay, I don't know how you are, your husbands and wives. I don't schedule anything for my wife. She doesn't schedule anything for me. Um, but Lou was able to bend Herbert Hoover and get him to sign up to talk to the League of Women Voters in Des Moines. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, this is not legible. Uh, this little thing here says, a few uh, important opinions on the work of the League of Women Voters, and it lists a dozen important men of the 20s. You know, uh, men of finance, men of politics, statesmen. And here's Mr. Hoover here. Uh, this, this is uh, page three, Secretary of Commerce on the League. The League of Women Voters is the most wide awake body of women in America today. They're a splendid group. They're woke. Yeah. 
And um, he actually, uh, Herbert Hoover does come to Des Moines and give this talk. He goes on to say, uh, he basically uh, talks about issues of the day. He doesn't pander to them. He doesn't talk about, oh, there, there, you're, you're coming. He says, the most important issue in the world today is where the U.S. stands on the, court, the international court of, uh, of justice. Should America be involved in this? It's a League of Nations thing. We're not in the League, but God, we should be a part of the Hague Court. If, you know, let, let us step into this. So he's doing an issues forum for these women. You know, he, he's all in. He, he's, he's bought into it. Um, and, he, and he ends his comments by saying, wisdom consists not in knowing what to do, but what to do next. Uh, the, real, the road of fundamental, uh, of fundamentals is all about real peace, and the maintenance of that road, or the creation of that road, is enduring goodwill between nations. I thought that was a pretty good quote for Hoover, who was not noted for giving good quotes in the 1920s. If you ever look at a Herbert Hoover speech from the 1920s, they tend to be 25 to 30 pages long, and if anybody says, oh, I've got a quote from Hoover from 1926 that's less than a paragraph long, it's probably not an accurate quote. They've probably truncated it somewhere. Um, campaign of 28. This is the uh, third time that women are going to vote in a national election. And the Republicans are quicker, I, would, I, I dare say, than the Democrats to pick up on, oh my god, there's a whole group of people that we should be pitching our, our, our talk to. Um, and they do. Um, Hoover gives uh, several speeches, several, literally five, six in the campaign of uh, 1928. His second speech talks to the issues of homes and women in America, talking about the 10 million working women who have a responsibility to, you know, to the household, to promoting the economy, to, uh, as he puts it, um, manage the local economy of their household. Uh, campaign literature of the time, 27 women and why they will vote for Herbert Hoover. Or if they say something people follow. Thank you. Without that nod, I was going to have to stop. Um, so he, uh, Hoover, and the Republican, the Republican Party are tapping into influencers. They call on uh, women writers, uh, women magazine writers, uh, novelists. Uh, there, there aren't a lot of women in positions of authority in America in the 1920s. That is something that happens actually with Hoover's administration and after. Uh, but they are able to tap into women like Charlotte Kellogg, who wrote several books in the 20s. And she says, you know, why am I for Herbert Hoover? Well, you know, he was the guy who saved all those lives in Belgium, walked away from misfortune, and, you know, has had women and children foremost in his mind as Secretary of Commerce. He was the guy who was a master of emergencies in, you know, in, in solving the Mississippi flood. I mean, it, it's basically, uh, you know, he's got, he, he's got your back. Uh, they tap Kathleen Murray, um, the, the, the General Federation of Women's Council. Uh, the League of Women Voters does not, because they are nonpartisan, does not jump on the train for Hoover. I salute the League of 1928. Uh, Hoover's, uh, the Republican Party, a uh, little history here, the party of Lincoln at this time, in 1928 had a little Q&A for the colored women voters. Why should colored women vote for Hoover? The party of Lincoln, the party of prosperity, the party that is anti-lynching. All of these things are resonating with the colored voters. Now, what I am curious about is how many 